And, and just like everybody else in this world, I've been uh, enjoying immensely um, the 10 part documentary uh, every Sunday night. We're seeing two at a time, two incredible hours um, called The Last Dance on ESPN. And the director uh, of this uh, incredible uh, product is on The Rich Eisen Show right now, Jason Hare. How are you, Jason? I'm great, man. How are you? Congrats on this in advance of our conversation here. It's just amazing. Well done. It's so great. Thanks very much. We're still we're still not done with the series. We're still working every day on finishing the final episodes, but it's it's great to see the positive response so far. No kidding. So you're still you're still working. You're in edit bays, et cetera, um, remotely or however you're doing this for for the final. Uh, well, how many episodes are you still working on right now? We're down to the last three right now. We're we're about first and goal from the one inch line on the on episode eight, um, and then we have um, nine and ten. We, we finished our final edit. Uh, for episode 10 on Friday at around midnight. So that was the end of a two-year process of all the picture is locked, and now it's a three-week process to, because this goes out to 185 countries, so they have to subtitle it, and they have to close caption it, and then there's sound design, and then an audio mix, and then color correction. So all kinds of um, just kind of sweeping up details, kind of like the extra point after a touchdown. But um, we still have some work, but the hard part is over. Well, I appreciate the football uh, analogies right here, Jason. Uh, the, the, all that said, uh, when did you get the call uh, and, and from whom to say, hey, I know this is, we're talking June, but we, we'd like to move this up because everybody is in need of a distraction right now with what's going on in the real world. When did you get that call? Pretty pretty immediate. After the, the shutdown went into effect, which I think was the, right after the Gobert game, we all kind of looked at each other. I think that was March 11th. And then that following Monday was the 16th. I think that by by that Wednesday, we were all talking ESPN, Netflix, and the NBA, and the Jordan brand, and, and my team were all talking internally about can we do this? And then uh, we had a call that week, and everyone said let's go for it. We can we can get these on the air because the first two or three were done by that point. So we had to just back time out. When are we going to have 10 done? Which is about around May 15th. So we said, all right, do we want to do 10 weeks in a row with one episode? Do we want to do two straight weeks with all 10 episodes leading up to May 17th? It was a lot of permutations, but I think they hit the right one with, with five weeks in a row with two per week. Jason Hare, the director of The Last Dance, joining me here on The Rich Eisen Show. I, so many different questions to ask you, but I think I'm going to go for the most important one is, how did you gain Jordan's trust? He's so relaxed. He's got, I guess, what his own personal tequila. He's like a, a fist in is what it looks like next to him. <laughs> just, uh, just a couple inches shy of a tumbler uh, with his cigar, and he's so comfortable. How did you gain his trust, Jason? Well, his, his team um, had the foresight to put me in front of him a few times in the lead-up to when we began shooting. So I met him in September of 17. This project was brought to me in July of 16, and we were um, in negotiations and all that for, for all of these partners to come together um, for well over a year. I actually had time to, to go off and make the Andre the Giant documentary for HBO while they were still at the table discussing high-level stuff as to who would air it and, and all kinds of stuff that I'm not involved in. So by the time I got out of Andre, they were still negotiating and wrapping up those negotiations, and we were ready to go, but I had ne- never met Michael at that point. So um, they put me in front of him three or four times within like an eight- or nine-month period just to hang out, nothing like nothing high-level, just relaxed, because I think he abhors meetings. He'd rather just like chill out with you and have a beer and, and, and talk a little bit and get to know you. So we did that a few times. So by the time we sat down for that first interview, he already knew me. It's not like he knows me well to this day. We've always spent, you know, a number of hours together. But I think he knew what my vision for the project was, and I think that he knew that he was in a safe space where, where I wasn't going to, you know, we, we tackle some subjects in this thing that people want us to tackle, but it's not done in a salacious way and it's not done in a gratuitous way. So I think that he felt comfortable that he had the right person telling the story, and, and hopefully that's, that's the comfort that you see. Um, exhibited by him. Yeah, and, and in terms of what you're going to tackle um, in, in future episodes, I want to put a pin in that, but I want to get into some of the stuff that you, you've already hit. Um, it, you know, Jordan said coming into this that uh, he, he, he was expecting not to come out smelling like a rose, but it sure looks like Jerry Krause is the is the antagonist here, Jason. Um, what, 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 what What's your take on on Krause's role in all this and where Reinsdorf sits because he he Reinsdorf's got that beautiful suit on but all I remember back when I was sitting on the sports center set was wondering why would Reinsdorf let Krause do whatever the heck he damn pleased when he could step in and change the dynamic with a snap of his fingers 
He could. Um, he he was running the White Sox and still is, you know, owner of the White Sox and the Bulls. And I, I think that 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 Reinsdorf is from a generation before the owners that we know, the Jerry Joneses and the Mark Cubans, who are sitting on the bench and standing on the sidelines and are very involved in personnel decisions and 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 things of that sort. Reinsdorf was old school, and he hired he hired Jerry Krause because they shared the same philosophy, and he trusted Krause's decisions. As he said in episode one, I didn't hire someone to win a personality contest. So I think that he was more content to to um, delegate than to dive in deep. He actually had to. He negotiated Michael's final couple of deals, which those are the ones that were for thirty and thirty three million apiece. He did those directly with David Falk, and then he was the one who flew up to see Phil uh, in the summer before that final season in the summer of 1997, but I think he trusted Jerry immensely, and you know what? Jerry earned that trust because all of those titles, the only piece that was in place when Jerry arrived was Michael Jordan, who would come a year before. Everything else, Jerry was the, the architect of those teams, so it's a little bit disappointing when, when I hear, and it's, it's, it's uh, totally not the fault of the audience because thus far, if you had to pick a villain, it's Jerry Krause. Um, he looks like a cartoon villain to begin with. He, yes. he, he, just, he checks off all the boxes, um, and it's easy to blame him, but a lot of people wanted credit for the success of those teams. I think David Halberstam said it best uh, when he said that Jerry uh, deserved more credit than he got, but he wanted more credit than he deserved. And I, that, that hits it right on the head. Jerry always just wanted to be one of the guys. He never was one. From the time he was a kid, he was never one of the guys. And now he's hanging out with the ultimate cool kids on, on the planet, and he's thinking, I put you guys all in place. I'm your boss. So I deserve to be on this bus. I deserve to be hanging out with you and cracking jokes. And he just never was going to be that. So I think by the end of the series, um, we, we, we did try to give Jerry his due. And you're going to see some people um, offer some super, superlatives about Jerry that you would not expect at this point in the series. Uh, the people who are speaking up on his behalf towards the towards the end of Episode 10 are going to be surprising to people. But um, I just wish that I could have interviewed Jerry myself because I had so many questions for him, and I would love to have gotten his take. You know, so many people with time, I think, that, that um, they're more honest. One of Michael's concerns at the outset of this thing was that people with this much time, in, in hindsight, would give their own version of the events and it wouldn't be accurate. And I was always of the opinion that, if anything, people are going to be more accurate because they're willing to be more honest because there's less at stake. A lot of these guys, you know, are, are, are only involved in the league, involved in the league remotely, whereas even 10 years ago they, they had more of a role with their teams and, and things like that. So it's been really great to see that these guys sat down and, and um, opened up and they were candid and they were generous with their opinions and their emotions. So hopefully uh, Jerry's, Jerry's um, character will get rounded out a little bit as the series goes on, but I think that there's no doubt that he was, um, at the very least, the architect of those teams who put the pieces in place for one of the greatest dynasties ever. Yeah, he passed away at the age of 77 in 2017, and he was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame that year posthumously. Jason Hare, the director of The Last Dance here on The Rich Eisen Show. How much of a conversation do you have with ESPN about allowing no bleeps and let everything work blue? Like you, like you have, it's been dynamite. It Zero. Really has been so real. I never would have had the temerity to even to even offer that up because I, I, I definitely thought that would have gotten shut down. You know, I, I, I thought we were lucky to get a cigar on TV with some of the rules that are in place, especially with a Disney company. But credit uh, John Dahl, and Libby Geist, and Connor Shell, and and all the way up to Jimmy Pataro and even Bob Iger. Um, had had a, a say in this thing, and all of them were adamant that this story should be told the way that it was meant to be told and the way that the characters tell it. So I was thrilled. I never, like I said, would have thought. I was hoping they would give us, you know, even at HBO, we had, there was a list of, like, you could, you could have three F words per half hour and you couldn't have anything. If someone was saying something, you know, that was explicit, it had to be referring just to, like, specific genitalia or something it couldn't be it was, it was all kinds of lists this was just like all right the rough one's going to be on espn and the the kid-friendly one's going to be on espn too and that's it so i was thrilled it's amazing uh, i mean just hearing the raw emotion of ron harper talking about not uh guarding <laughs> yeah. jordan was amazing and then you know um uh, uh horace grant what he called uh, the pistons straight up last night because yeah. they didn't shake their hands and jordan's reactions and the way he's I think it's amazing, Jason, and I and I do credit everybody to to, to let the because it just does. I understand it's it's uh, working blue and the language is is not safe for work, but it does lend a certain sort of rawness to the emotion that we need to hear. Uh, that said, what what Rodman story hit the cutting room floor, Jason? There had to be one or two or five 
about last night? Nothing explicit. I, I would have loved to have go gone more into because I think it's easy to paint Dennis as a, as a caricature. You know, he's got the, these, he's got the the tattoos and the piercings and all that. But I've I've always been of the opinion that all that stuff is armor and that there's a there's a much softer guy inside. And we had so many stories about what a gentle guy this guy was, even when he came to the Bulls. His first day of training camp in ninety five, ninety six, no one wanted to talk to him. He was just off shooting by himself in the corner. And Bill Wennington came in and, and said, why is no one talking to Dennis? And they all said, well, we don't know what to say to him. And, and Bill and Dennis shared an agent, and he came over and said, hey, how you doing? I mean, Dennis is an introvert, and I know it's not clear when you show him in Vegas and he's surrounded by women and, and uh, cigar smoke and, and he's doing the kamikaze shots, but he is at heart an introvert. And this is a guy who was looking for a father his entire life, never had one. And he, he, he found one in Chuck Daly. And he found one in Phil Jackson, and he found an authoritarian, an authoritative figure in Michael. He just wanted structure, this guy. That's it. And he wanted to be wanted. He wanted to be loved. I think Dennis is deep down a really needy guy. He wants attention because he wants people to love him in some way. So I wish we could have uh, uh, dived a little bit deeper into that. But as as ridiculous as it sounds, 10 hours isn't enough time to – to tell all the stories that we had to tell. So we had to just scratch the surface on that. And I know you got to go in, a, in about a minute, so just some quick hitters. Uh, how deep do you get into uh, Jordan's uh, baseball tenure and why he quit and what the, the, the rumors about all that are? Do you, hit, do you hit any of that? Deep, deep. We got in, into everything. I mean, to Michael's credit, there was nothing that was off limits. And um, we interviewed David Stern extensively about it. We interviewed... Rod Thorne and Brian McIntyre, all the people who made the decisions that, that would have been made if he, if he were this, if, if this secret suspension uh, occurred. You know, my brother Paul uh, is a lawyer down in Miami, and I consulted him for exactly how to ask these questions of David Stern because there's no one more savvy and more fun to, to, to interview and spar with than David Stern, and, and, and he's just been, you know, a hero of mine forever for his intelligence and his, and his work ethic and what he did with the league. So we had the perfect wording. Um, that, that he would have to answer, if, if he answered these things and they were truthful, then that it would put all these rumors to rest. So we spend a couple of episodes on the arc of Michael leaving, why he left, the rumors about why he left, the truth about whether or not those rumors are true, and then his return. Episode 7 and 8, uh, uh, May 10th is when you can get all that. So are you saying you were more nervous interviewing David Stern than either President Clinton or Obama, is what you're saying? Different levels of, of nervousness, okay. apples, apples nervousness and orange nervousness, but I wasn't trying to get uh, definitive legal uh, statements out of <laughs> Obama and Clinton. <laughs> that not. And then the last question uh, that is the most important question, Chris Brockman, you have that. I, I know you want to ask this question. Yeah, of so course. That... Are we going to see Rich with hair in any of these episodes, Jason? Yes. Yes. Oh my we are. Gosh. Oh, it's, yes. uh, it's, it's, it's luscious and flowing and, and uh, you know. <laughs> No special effects needed, man. It just jumps off the screen. The uh, reason why we, you, you don't have many of those is because Stewart always demanded the Jordan stuff. I never really got a word in edgewise when it came to Jordan, Jason, Stewart's to be honest. Stewart's voice is in this. I think his face appears in it a few times. And Michael, as you know, as a UNC guy, is a huge fan of Stewart. So, I know that. So he's uh, sorely missed, but it's great to, to, to feel his presence in this thing because I'm sure he'd be thrilled to be a part of it, too. Jason, congrats. You're being pulled in many different directions. I appreciate you being allowed to be pulled into this one. This is dynamite. Can't wait for the next six. Thanks so much for having me, Rich. You got it. That's Jason Hare, the director of The Last Dance.